All right. Well, welcome to another episode of Big Ideas in App Architecture. I am super excited today to welcome Matt Ranny on the show. Matt is a, what should I say, principal engineer? What's the official title? Principal engineer at, at DoorDash? That That is my current title, yes. That is your current title. So I... um. You know, I'd love to get this thing kicked off by just learning a little bit more about you. I, I like to start episodes this way just because I think everybody has such a unique and interesting story to tell. And I had the opportunity, and I'll leave it to meet with you beforehand, but kind of take a look through your LinkedIn profile. And you have done some really interesting and exciting things. So maybe we just kind of start with kind of what you've been, you know, what you're up to now, but maybe we'll spend a little time kind of getting to know you about, uh, you know, where you, where you were before. Uh, yeah. Being at DoorDash. Well, so well, way, way back when I, uh, you know, I worked uh, on um, in like the ISP business, like doing, you know, uh, internet routing uh, back when the internet was much, much smaller and, um, you know, re really got exposed to a bunch of cool stuff uh, about like, you know, the, the way things really work behind the scenes. And um, that, that, um, that kind of, shaped the the way that I kind of went, went about the rest of uh, the rest of the things that I worked on is is you know see, seeing the the internet like become a real thing and you know kind of working behind the scenes on it uh, was was pretty cool and you know so I, I did a bunch of uh, a bunch of related things for a while mo mostly trying to measure or visualize or 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 do analytics on helping people understand what their networks were doing. Um, so did that for a while and then, um, had an opportunity to, um, to, to work on a, a pretty interesting application of networking technology, which was, uh, making voice over IP work, um, in Iraq. And so this is, I know that's kind of like out of, out of left field a bit, but, um, uh, that's just sort of the, the, the way, you know, the, the way life works sometimes sure. is, uh, I, I got that opportunity and it turned out, uh, it's a super interesting problem. It's really, really hard to, um, you know, we're, we're using these, uh, these satellite internet, you know, like, uh, ge geostationary satellite, satellite internet, high latency. Everyone says, oh, you can't do voice on that, but. It turns out you can, it just means there will be quite a lot of latency and you will have to really stretch, uh, kind of the jitter buffers and, and kind of the, the, the other things I'm getting maybe too detailed about like uh, voice over IP, which is a fun topic for me, but, um, eh, everyone said you couldn't do it. And, um, I was like, I bet you can do it. And it turns out you can. And so, uh, so I did that for a while. And in the process of, of, of working on that problem, um, we, you know, the, uh, the, the co-founder of this company that, that I had done, done this work for, um, we, we got together and we thought we would try to do a, a sort of consumer version of this now that, um, you know, mobile phones were getting more powerful. And so I started a company with him called Voxer, sure. which was kind of a, a continuation of that same idea. Which and was when like, was this? So this was this was in the early two thousands, was it? Yeah, yeah, about then. I'm I'm bad with dates, unfortunately. I, I always have to like look it up. Um, yeah, two thousand seven ish, <laughs> I think. Yeah. If I if I look at your profile, okay, that makes sense. Anyway, we we started before the first iPhone came out, and so we 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 were we were trying to make this work on on pre iPhone devices, and it. Uh, that was not very easy. <laughs> pre, pre iPhone devices were, uh, were not so good. So, um, but anyway, it was, that was a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting thing to work on. Um, try, trying to make li live voice work over on very low powered, you know, by modern standards, very low powered devices, very slow and unreliable, uh, mobile data. And, so, but we did, you know, we, we, we made it work as, as, as well as you could, could make it work and, um, got, got sort sort of popular, but that was, that was, uh, I, wor I worked on that for, for quite a few years. It, it took a long time before we actually had something that was useful. Um, but anyway, uh, the, it, it, you know, we, there was an interesting, uh, kind of dynamic that we had, which is we didn't have very many employees, you know, like 
places like like Uber and you know DoorDash or whatever, you know, thousands of thousands of engineers. You know, you go to like your your, your Facebooks and your Googles, and you know, tens of thousands of engineers. We had seven, and so um, in order to uh, in order to support you know millions of concurrent users with seven engineers, we had to do some kind of clever architectural choices and. Um, uh, amazingly, that that system is, as far as I know, still working. <laughs> Even though, like, I don't think anyone's anyone's really done much to it in in years and years. Um, but yeah, that that was that was kind of um, that that was uh, you know le learned a lot about like how, how to how you can do some big scale stuff with with not a big engineering team. Um, then I went to Uber where we had a big engineering team, or certainly we, we built one right before my eyes, uh, while I was there and, you know, it, it worked on so, some similar problems, you know, how can you, how, how can we make this thing reliable and that, you know, that sort of thing. Um, then I got an opportunity while I was there, um, when Uber, uh, started to build a self-driving car program, um, I had actually worked on. The, a self-driving car for the DARPA challenge uh, with some other friends in the Bay Area. And we, you know, made one out of a, you know, old car we bought on Craigslist and borrowed some early LIDARs and made a... Made a... I, I see a consistent theme here, like kind of making a lot uh, with very little seems to be kind of flowing through the, uh, the story. Yeah. Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, so then, um, you know, U Uber had started this program and I uh, just kept asking, uh, persistently asking until eventually they were like, ah, I guess you don't have a degree in robotics, but you do seem you do seem to know, uh, know a little bit and uh, fine. So um, so I started working uh, on, on self-driving, which is yet another super interesting, different problem. Um, and, and there I was working on, uh, you know, building a simulator to kind of validate the, um, uh, you know, validate the autonomy software. Like I, in case you don't know, I, these cars are very, very expensive. You know, uh, the, the, the prototype versions of them are, you know, they don't have very many of them and they, they, they cost a lot. So if you want to test your software, you probably don't want to test it on a vehicle, even on a closed course or whatever. It's just way too slow, right? You want to test it in. CI, right? <laughs> like in some kind of non-car environment. So anyway, we built a simulator that was like a video game that the cars would like drive around in. Yep. So did did that for a while, and um, that was um, that that autonomy problem is a real tough one. Um, and so, and then. Um, I had an opportunity then to to go work with some of my uh, my former uh, Uber colleagues uh, who had gone to DoorDash, and so I've been there for for a couple of years now, and and working on on similar kind of like back end things and just like in general how how can we uh, like how can we scale an engineering team like get you know <laughs> like not have everyone be blocked all the time basically. What kind of like abstractions or interfaces or systems can we build so that we can harness the the you know the full power of this mighty engineering team? One of the things I I'd love to explore a little bit because it's top of mind for us right now is is just what you ended on, which is this idea of you know properly scaling engineering teams. Yeah. Um, you know, because I think one of the things that you called out, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, because uh, I'm, I'm sure your current employer you know, may end up listening. But, you know, I, th I think one of the things that certainly I have felt recently is, um, you know, an appreciation, maybe even a longing for times when things were smaller, you know, there were there were less people you had, you had more control. And you've now seen it really from, I think, both extremes where, you know, you're starting a company, you get to have like all the control, um, you know, up to working with obviously these these very large global companies where there's now hundreds or thousands. I mean, can we talk a little bit just about, you know, A, I think I'd love to understand a little bit about kind of what DoorDash's philosophy is in general, but, you know, maybe more specifically, what's your philosophy about scaling teams? And then, you know, it, it, I, I guess not wanting to put you on the spot, like which, you know, 
if, if maybe not the answer is, you know, which do you prefer or the question is which you prefer, but you know, what are the, the pros and cons maybe of, of, of those really small tight knit teams where you have to do everything, you have to go the extra mile mm-hmm. versus kind of these large teams. I know there's a lot there, but I, I yeah, sure. Sure. Well, 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 let, let me, let me just say something real quick about the, the, you know, the, the small team environment, um, you know, that, that, that we had at Voxer, it's like there, there is a power to the, uh, constraint in that if, if you truly only ever only have seven people, like you, you, you just can't do everything. Like not only can you not do everything you want to do, you just can't even think about, it. you can't even say, boy, it sure would be nice. It's like, you don't even have time for that. We're just like, listen, what is something that I know we can do? And, and I know it will just be automated. And, and I think that that is curiously as, as teams get larger, we, you end up to having like lots more manual steps just cause it just sort of, I don't know, it sort of seems like that's responsible or, or you can't think of any other way to do it. Um, but when there's only seven people, it's like, no, this hundred percent has to be automated. There's no way we're ever looking up any of this, any like users have problems. Like, I don't know, and unless we can see the, you know, aggregate user behavior change, we're never going to do anything about it. And obviously they are not paying us any money and we're giving stuff away for free. Right. So that's, a, you know, at a, at a place like Uber or DoorDash, where you're like moving money around, you can't just let customers have a bad day, right? <laughs> like you have to actually, you know, uh, help them all. Um, so it's not a not an entirely a fair comparison, but but I think that the the interesting thing about though, like you know, the extreme, like taking it all the way to like oh seven people, wow. Um, you you if you start by thinking how will this be automated, and and I I definitely know that what most of the other places that I have been in, um, they start by saying, well, let's just get some docs together and write a bunch of docs, you know, well, we can probably just do all this in a spreadsheet, you know, um, you know, like, like these manual processes, like I just, it just seems easy. It's just, but it, that because you have so many people and, you know, do you think, I wonder too, if there's something in there about, you know, I don't want to call it productivity because that could be kind of a dangerous concept, but I, I, I do feel like, you know, when there are only seven people, when you have very limited resources and you know, you can't go back to, you know, finance or whomever and say, look, I need more, I need another person to do this. I need another person to do that. Um, that, that you just, you're almost forced into making better decisions, you know, whether it's architecturally or for whatever reasons, you know, kind of, and, and when those constraints are removed, you know, it seems, it seems very easy to kind of put everything off. Like I, I'll just, maybe I won't do it quite as well as I know I could, or I won't think it through quite as well as I could because I can always just get somebody else, you know, or I can add a, a resource or capacity to overcome, you know, challenges. I, do you think there's like a productivity angle where you just, you're kind of working harder and more focused in these smaller teams than maybe in larger teams? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. I, I think there's, there's certainly something, there's something there. I mean, I think there's, there's definitely something in terms of like the, the more people that you have to coordinate with, like just, just cause there are more people and you need to tell them what you're doing. Um, like there, that's just like inherently in, inefficient, right? Like, like you, you, you can't need to tell everybody everything. Like it, it it's just, it, there's no way that that can ever work. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, so the, I guess I, I should, I should be, I should be really, really clear that um, that just because we pulled this off with seven people, um, I, I bet you we upset a lot of our users because like we just couldn't, you know, fix problems, <laughs> you know, um, I, and and I also know that the number of product features that we had was much smaller than like a like a DoorDash, right? Like DoorDash has 
vast complexity in all of the different ways in which it can work and all the different humans that are involved, uh, you know, it, it, as part of the way that the system works, it's just way, way, way more complicated. That said, in a big organization, um, I, I think it can be it can be tempting to sort of um, ignore or, or, or overlook this kind of like automation first idea and and do things that that seem um, in, in a really weird way more correct. Like people will say, oh, yes, it's it's more correct if we, you know, adopt this, you know, design pattern that I read about or or, you know, like, like do, do some, you know, some, something in the name of, of, of correctness, because, you know, we have the engineering resources to do it right. And I think curiously, uh, a lot of times that those, those so-called correct solutions end up being just more expensive and harder for everyone to work with. Um, they, they, they end up doing, you know, end up having in, in many ways, like the opposite um, uh, effect uh, of, of like sort of scaling and flexibility. And, um, I mean, it's, it, it, it is a, it is a weird paradox. Do you have a, out of curiosity, do you have a technology or a pattern that comes to mind when you're saying this, that, that you could share? Because something came to mind to me, but I, I, I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. And I, sure, I sure, sure. I mean, it, it, it actually, I mean, I'm meeting it in a, in a, in a fairly general, in a fairly general way, but but it just to, as as two examples of just how general this is, um, uh, here's one, which is a lot of folks will say, oh, you know, it's um, uh, it's super important that we have uh, this exact number of test coverage. They're like, oh, this is best practice. We gotta get to eighty. I don't know, I don't know some number, right? Like some number of of unit test coverage. But um, somehow, even with that, we still ship bugs. Like we still ship bugs. The thing still, like it still crashes. But but how is that possible? Well, it's possible because unit tests are are very, very narrowly focused in a distributed system, which nearly everyone is building these days, um, ends up actually not being as useful as, you know, integration or functional tests or you know, whatever you want to call, like putting all the pieces together and like running it, like r running the whole thing end to end. Um, I mean, it's it's somewhat counterintuitive in, in a way because like people have been told unit test coverage is the way professional software gen engineers do things. And even now, I'm I am afraid what, of what people are going to say when they hear me say that. Am, am I am I implying that unit tests are bad? Like, no, I'm not saying they're bad, but like this kind of strict adherence to like, we can't ship this. I think it's like very it's true. I, you know, that's actually a really good one. It's not the one I was thinking of, but I think it's a really good one. It, and it is emblematic of, of, I think something we see a lot in this, in this field is in, and I've seen this in, in a number of places in a number of ways where we get very focused on certain metrics, you know? So like, and, it, and and I am going to meet this metric come hell or high water, right? Without mm. maybe stopping to reconsider, is that exactly relevant any longer given other things that are happening in my stack or, you know, other things that are happening in the world? We, you know, it's definitely something that, that kind of resonates with me. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I have to have 80% test coverage. Well, okay, but are we maybe in danger of optimizing for the wrong metric? Maybe it's not the amount of test coverage. Maybe it's, you know, the number of P1s or P2s or whatever, you know, other, you know, kind of end result to the customer is. And I think, I think oftentimes, at least in software engineering application architecture, I feel like sometimes we get stuck in kind yeah. of optimizing toward metrics that, you know, yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with unit testing. It's a wonderful thing, but you can't just, you can't run around and say mission accomplished just because you hit a certain number of test coverage. Cause you're right. I mean, bugs will still happen. Yep. Yep. You're still, you're still going to ship bugs. Um, yeah. So, well, here, here's another example. Um, uh, people, uh, have a lot of strong opinions about, 
uh, what kind of database you should use and how you should use it, um, uh, per perhaps relevant to your interests, um, uh, your, your professional interests. The, um, uh, like here, here's an example. Um, well, we, if to do what you're suggesting, we will have to give up on strong consistency. Isn't that bad? I've heard it was bad. We're moving money around. You can't have, you know, eventual consistency if you're moving money around. Right. And, you know, the funny part is that's like literally how the financial network works <laughs> but like like none of that none of that is 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 strong consistency but anyway um uh you, you know on, on the same topic like oh we should have uh you know th there's a way that you should design your you know your, your schema you should never denormalize things um etc and it's like you know maybe sometimes maybe maybe, th maybe that's true sometimes but 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 I think people get um, kind of the, you know the, for for this those same reasons like while, while trying to to sort of be good professional software engineers they will end up making a much harder system to work on and maintain and operate than if they were just like well why are we doing this I, I'm curious what your thoughts are on two other things that have come to mind I think we we've talked about, a little bit about them in, in previous podcasts and they're 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 front and center, at least in my mind, with some of the work we've been doing recently. Obviously, I want to talk more about database stuff, but um, I, two other technologies or, or concepts I think sometimes we we get too religious about, and you know, is is one, and you may you may you and I may not agree on this. Is is um, well, no, it, it's just uh, the pendulum swung so hard to microservices, like everything, 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 all the time. Um, so that's one. And then the other one, which, you know, and again, I'd love to hear more about what you guys are doing relative to both these things. The other thing, technology, I, I think sometimes, at least in my work out in the field, working with all sorts of organizations is people kind of like, I've got to adopt Kubernetes. Like I have to, um, but why, you know what? I, I just have to, you know? And so I, I feel like there's this, at least in the, in the work we're seeing, there's certainly the database aspect, but it's, 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 man, I, I've got to, we got, we're migrating everything we have to microservices and we're migrating everything we have to Kubernetes. And, and sometimes, you know, my experience has been, I'm curious yours, you know, those technologies also come with a, a ton of complexity, you know, that sometimes isn't always obvious. Yeah. 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 Well, look, let, I, I, I have a, um, I, I I have a sort of high level observation um, about is it about both? Well, it's definitely about one of those things. Maybe it's about both. We'll see. Um, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is um, something like these kind of infrastructure choices, like like oh, you should use Kubernetes or whatever. Um, the the fact that so many people know what Kubernetes even is um, is kind of surprising to me because I I feel like at this point it should be so low in the stack that people uh, interact with. Like, I, I don't know why we would expose most people to Kubernetes. I mean, I, it's super fiddly and low level. It's got a million different options and, and, and like, I, it, it's, it's like a, it's like looking into the engine room of, of your, you know, of your system and like, yeah, someone's got to go in there. Yeah, of course they do. Right. Obviously, but not everybody. So I, I actually don't think people, so like, I don't really care one way or the other if people use Kubernetes. I just don't think we should be exposing those low level interfaces to most like people writing services to run a business. Like, I totally agree with you. I think it's just one, it's, it's another example in my mind of those things that people get very caught up in. You know, it's like, I, I'm going to, I must meet this metric or I must yeah. adopt this technology, you know, but it's like, oh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know. I, I might be able to get you to the same end goal or what the, you know, what goal you really want without necessarily worrying about things that, you know, that A, are, are archaic or B, you know, uh, you know, not necessarily at the level of detail you need to be concerning yourself with. Yep. And, and for what it's worth, Kubernetes, fine. Uh, I, I got nothing against it. I just think that like, it is a natural progression. We should all be trying to automate ourselves out of a job and move up the stack. And it's like, 
you know, we used to like fiddle around in data centers and I'd spent all this time in these deeply air conditioned rooms, racking and stacking and being very proud of like, you know, very tidy cable management. You know, it's like, I, it has been a long time since I've been in a data center and I, it just, you know, Kubernetes is like that. I think it's like, you, you did, you didn't used to send a lot of people to the data center. It used to be like one or two people that you, you know, even had the access card or whatever. But like, I think that applies to, you know, to, to this as well. I just, I think that should just be abstracted away, but, but I, I want to talk about your other, the other topic you mentioned, which is like, which is microservices and like, sh like why, like why, why, why do people do it? And is, is it good or not? So I've, I've given quite a few talks about, about this topic. So I have, I have any number of opinions, um, could, could go on and on, but, but I think the, the really interesting thing to get really clear about before you do it is why. So like, maybe if you, like most people start out with some kind of a monolith, you know, whether it's a, you know, rails or Django or, or, you know, whatever they, they've got something that like got their service going and now it's getting hard. So it's cool to say like, oh, we should do this services, but like to do it without knowing exactly why you want that. I, Cause I think, I think people just sort of assume that it's like all good. Uh, Cause they see the bad. They're like, oh, this is getting really hard to work. We're all stepping on each other. And like, yeah, you probably are. <laughs> like it's, it's kind of hard as without, really good build and release tooling, you know, mer merge queues, you know, clever, clever analysis about like the way the modules are laid out to like know whether one change can affect another change and stuff like that. You can still do it. Like people do do it, but like it's doesn't happen without work. So, so I, I totally get that people run into friction when with monolith and go, Hey, microservices here, let's go. And it's like super fun at first, but the, the main thing that, that I think that, that I, I wish everyone would, would fully internalize is that you're adding a, a new dimension of partial failure. And those are very hard to test for. And I, I think if we would just get a handle on that kind of the rest of the problems would, would sort of go away. Like if we had a really good strategy for partial failure or just understanding, oh, wait, you mean sometimes this won't work? Like, hmm, I don't know, is that good? <laughs> that might be bad. It's like, well, what are you supposed to do? You know, you know. so Netflix has talked a lot about like, oh, you're, we got fallbacks and, you know, we can do a degraded experience and, you know, that's cool. And I think in many cases, depending on what the product is and what the service is, and there's obvious things you could do for fallbacks, but like, what, like, what are you supposed to do at DoorDash when you used to like check out and it's like, you got a degraded experience. <laughs> like we didn't quite check out, you know, you didn't quite get your food, but you know, we'll like show you a picture of it or something and you can imagine what it would be like. We'll give you someone else's food. Right. Obviously not, right? Like we actually have to give you your food. Um, so so it doesn't always make sense. And and just re reasoning about that, like partial failure, like degraded modes of operating and how to validate that it's doing the correct thing in these partial failure cases, I it, it's that that is the hard part. Yeah, I, I think I think that's it's very true not only for microservices, but you know I think you know large distributed systems in general. I mean they they are wonderfully complex and solve some really interesting and important things. But I, I think my my thinking on all of it is you just have to be aware that there is this like you know hidden complexity. You know whether it's for exactly the reasons you described or other things. You know, and sometimes these panaceas I think that we create for ourselves don't always turn out that way. I mean, like you said, you know, it's maybe the the early period, the honeymoon period looks great, but like the farther you get into this, when things start to go uh, bump in the night or bump in the day, as as I remember Sean saying once on a webinar, um, a former colleague of yours, you know, it's yeah. like 
um, that's when when things get really scary. And these and and the more complex the underlying system, the harder it is, I think, to to figure out exactly, you know, what went wrong. Yep. Yeah. So, I, oh, you know, there's one, one more thing I wanted to say about that, which is that I I think that it is possible to um, to to do the kind of testing that we need to do for microservice architectures. But for, for whatever reason, like it's kind of doesn't like people don't do it or if they do do it, they don't talk about it. So I'm pretty sure it's the first one. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that they just kind of wait for it to fail. And you know, people talk about like, oh, chaos testing. Oh, let's just break stuff and see what happens. But like, Breaking stuff to see what happens, like tells you what, may, like maybe you understand why it happened, maybe, but without understanding what it should do, when that thing breaks, it it ends up. I don't even think to be that useful. So what what I think we need to do is build out uh, fault injection. So like you you run an, these end to end tests with precisely uh, injected faults and the test harness. Um, knows that the fault has been injected and it knows what the correct behavior is when one of the, when this partial failure condition happens. And I, I don't know of any way to specify that. Like how, how do you write a test that says, by the way, two, you know, A calls B calls C. If C fails, A's test can know that when C fails, this is the right thing to do. Um, so I think other people have come at it from different angles where we are working on a, a similar system to that, which, which I'm, uh, I'm very, is very promising so far. I think it's going to be very cool. Uh, you'll hopefully we'll, um, I think we actually did do a blog post about it already on the, on the DoorDash blog, this, um, this framework called filibuster, um, might want to check that out. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, so it's, it's, you know, it, it's, um, you know, we, we, we wrote about it. So, I mean, but it's, it, it, it basically, it tries to address that problem. It gives you a way to write your tests that has hooks that say, we injected these faults. Um, so when, when you're handling errors, you can say, oh, okay, yeah, this is actually what we should have done. Um, but it, you know, it, it basically, it, it intercepts the RPCs with a, you know, some, some, some clever magic, that, like the same way that open telemetry and other kind of similar similar systems work um, where you can kind of transparently interpose on your, on your network calls and uh, break them, you know, but, but in a precise way. So anyway, it's, it's, it's still, it's still pretty early days uh, for us on that, but um, it's uh, I think it's, I think it's going to be really good. I think, I think something like that, if, you know, we got that sort of standardized and well accepted, um, I think that fixes most of the problems. Yeah, I can see that being enormously useful. Certainly, I think, you know, for us and what we do, I mean, understanding, you know, failures and being able to inject those would be enormously, enormously powerful. I, I think kind of where I was going to go, and I think it's actually a really, really good segue, which is, you know, I think underpinning, uh, underpinning, you know, your comments about testing is, you know, when, when things go wrong, right, there is an impact. I mean, you were kind of t joking about, you know, orders not being fulfilled. You know, what is, I mean, what is kind of the DoorDash thinking on, on, on the impact of, of these kinds of failures? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what does it mean to, to DoorDash if a, a system goes down, microservices go down, a database goes down? You know, how do you all think about that? How are you working to resolve that? What's the impact of those things? I just think that's, that's such a fascinating company because as we've seen over the last couple of years with COVID and like, you know, DoorDash's popularity, I think has just, has gone through the roof and tons and tons of, uh, of usage. I mean, how, how do you guys think about it? What are, what are the impact when thing, things don't work? Yeah. I mean, well, like I said, they, it's, it's really hard. Like par partial failure is complete failure for a lot of stuff that we do. And, you know, we, we have a lot of services and a lot of them, have to be up. Um, now, uh, we have been able to carve out um, some kind of, uh, you know, domains or like phases of the, of the kind of like ordering flow, so that like, 
they're allowed to fail independently. We've, we've now gotten to the point where we have multiple deployments that are, you know, sh sharded geographically. So, um, you know, if one of them breaks, it doesn't cause, doesn't always cause a global outage. So we're, 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 you know, we're doing some bulkheading and, uh, you know, by, by the, by the markets and also by like the, the, the phases of the order. So like the browsing, you know, and then the, like, the, the interacting with the, with the, the merchant and then the interacting with the, with the dasher, like th those three things can, can kind of fail independently of each other. And so, so maybe no new orders come in for a little bit, but all the ones that came in will, you know, keep, you know, keep getting fulfilled or, or the other way around, like, you know, maybe we can accept them briefly and, and while, while we fix the problem with the fulfillment side, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's been a huge project that it's basically what I've been working on since for, for most of the time uh, that I started, I've only somewhat recently been shifting to like, how can we, you know, how can we get more, I only get more efficiency with this large team is somewhat, somewhat more of a recent project, but you know, mostly I've been working on how can we make our system more reliable? And that was kind of the, the two things that we did was like, you know, par partitioning the flows so that they're somewhat isolated and, you know, bu bulk heading by market. Now you guys, I, I think we talk about this, we've talked about this publicly. I mean, you guys are users of Cockroach, oh, yeah. correct? Oh yeah. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about kind of where it fits in or how it fits in or what y'all are using it for? And obviously don't share things you're not comfortable sharing, but just be curious to, to understand kind of what, yeah. what drew you to the technology and, and kind of how it's being used to some extent. Sure, sure. So we have, you know, we have a, a lot of services. Um, uh, it, it, it's hard to give you the exact number because like what we, we, we don't have is a, is a crisp definition of what constitutes a service. Um, and so anyway, but um, let, I mean, let's just say it's definitely hundreds, you know, it's, it's many hundreds of what you might call services. And most of them have some amount of state that they need to maintain. And uh, a lot of them use cockroach to maintain that state. Um, and it's, it's for all, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, we have, we have hundreds of cockroach clusters. That's awesome. Well, I, we've been talking a lot about technology. One of the things I'm mostly in, or have been interested in really this entire time uh, is what, and I know people who are just listening won't be able to appreciate this, but what on earth is happening behind you? I think when you and I first met, um, I, I thought maybe this was a background, but it is not, it is not a background. It's your real background. Tell us a little bit about kind of what clearly interests you outside of, of keeping uh, DoorDash up and around. Yeah, for sure. Um, so this is uh, this is a, a building in you know out behind my garage in in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I live, and it is uh, it started as a music studio, and then COVID happened, and then it turned into a music studio slash office, <laughs> and and so um, so yeah, you know my 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 band plays here. Or I will. You know, I have a bunch of different instruments and I will screw around with, you know, making electronic music or whatever. Um, but yeah, most, unfortunately, um, you know, but for, for my recreational interest, mostly what I do in here is work, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, I do, I do like to make music. When, I see a guitar I, up there. Are you a guitar player? I mean, are there uh, yeah. multiple instruments that you play or is yeah. it? Yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's an electric guitar over there and there's a bass guitar over there. And then uh, I don't know if the auto zoom is going to support, but I've got so you know, pad controllers and keyboard and, you know, there's a bunch of fun stuff in here. Yeah, that's it. it's by far for those of you who can't see. It's by far the best background I think I've ever seen uh, on a Zoom meeting in the last couple of years. It's like it seems like it'd be the the. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It is. Um, it is. It is a fun place for sure. Um, so maybe you know, as we kind of wrap up here, you know, one of the things 
I, I've enjoyed listening to or hearing from from various folks is kind of things that they're excited about, you know, coming into the you know this this upcoming year. Obviously, we've spent the last couple of years in a in a world of, of, of challenges and change. And, and, but, but I don't know, maybe it's because it's spring, maybe it's because our new fiscal year is starting. I feel like there's just some optimism, you know, what, are, what are some things you're excited about, you know, kind of, as you look forward to this upcoming year, whether it's, it's personally or, you know, things you're doing at DoorDash or with technology, just, just curious what, what you're kind of excited about looking forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, uh, I guess a couple of things. Um, I am, uh, I'm pretty excited that we are now, we're now finally working on um, em- embracing this kind of um, change based data access. So we're, we're, we're leaning into, you know, CDC, uh, like, like really hard. And, um, I, you know, I, the, the amount of like the, the, the amount of, uh, let's see how do I put this, um, our, we do way more reads than writes, like way, way more, uh, because we have hundreds of services, right? And they're all kind of percolating their data around. And I am, uh, I am excited about um, being able to do uh, fewer trips through the call graph. And so we're, we are. That's why we are, we are doing a lot with, uh, with, with CDC. Um, that, and I think that's, it's going to, you know, it's still, it's still pretty early days, but that stuff is going to mature soon. And I think that's going to be very cool. Um, but the, the new project that I, that I'm working on is, is I, I think also pretty excited. It has nothing to do with data storage, kind of, I guess most, not really, but sort of does, um, which is, uh, you know, something I've been wanting to build for a long, long time. And it is, it is a way that we can, um, I, what, what I've been calling it composable event processors. So, so we have this model where um, there are these workflows that are, are um, you know, they're, they're important parts of the, you know, the way the product works, but um, lots of different people want to make changes to that, to that one thing. So the, the microservices model doesn't work, right? Cause like everybody needs to get into this, you know, like they want to change what happens when you click the checkout button. It's like, it's a pretty important button, you know, and a lot of people have different stuff that they want to do in there. Um, so we're, uh, I'm working on building a kind of plugin architecture for these important flows that will allow uh, different teams to, to sort of safely uh, make the changes to how these core flows work. And the, the safely is the, is the really interesting part. Um, still, still early days on that. Um, I, I hope we will, uh, uh, you know, when, when you ask me about this again in, you know, six months or a year, I will have, you know, great, great stories to, uh, to tell you about how great it is. Um, but anyway, that's, no, that's, that's interesting. And, and you, the, the first thing you mentioned with CDC, you're referring to change data capture, kind of a, the cockroach thing or just in a more of a general concept? Uh, I mean, certainly uh, with all of our cockroach, we are, yes, <laughs> but <laughs> we, we want the same, the same from our, our other storage systems. Yeah. As well. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Change um, feed just in general has been a, a, a kind of a really interesting thing, you know, just this ability to kind of emit changes as, as things yep. are happening in the database is certainly pretty interesting. And I know an area we've been making tons and tons of investment and change in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, that that is is it is incredibly powerful, and it's that is one of those things that I think when I first heard about it, I didn't quite get. Like, why, why, like, what, what is the big deal with that? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, okay, fine, you can, you know, send, you know, your make your data warehouse get updated more efficiently, but like, building like, le- letting other people kind of build projections of your data. I think is the yeah it's it, it's been fascinating certainly from my perspective just talking about uh and, and working with a bunch of external customers it's starting to be kind of the underpinning of a lot of really neat things and i think as a result you know we're certainly like i said investing a lot of time and energy and just making sure that it can you know it, it can and meet those needs from a security stability reliability and maybe more importantly observability perspective you know um 
Final thought, I don't want to keep you much more, but again, you and I talked about before, I, obviously my background is a bunch of books. I, I don't have musical instruments like you, so I, I, um, I have books. Uh, anything you're reading that you like to read that's that you'd recommend to people, you know, about technology or otherwise? Boy, let's see. I I have to say that when when I sit down to um, you know to to read, it is uh, it it is often well, I would say it's almost always not about technology. <laughs> um, but but I do I, I do like to to um, to watch a lot of. Um, I watch a lot of like conference videos, you know, like talks people have given at other conferences and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the main way that I like le- learn about stuff that's going on is I'm what, curious, watching people's conference. Talks. Just on, on that thought is where I mean, do you find it as I do it, it is difficult to stay on top of all the changes that are happening out there with technology? I mean, I, I it seems like every day there's, you know, there's a, a new solution to a new problem. Do you find it, you know, especially in your role, do you find it somewhat overwhelming to, to kind of stay on top of all the happenings? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I feel like I used to, but I've sort of, I've sort of made peace with it, uh, because yeah, well, I, I think working at a bigger company, you, 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 you basically have to, because you, well, well, you can do well, some things if you, you know, all agree that you're going to go do, you can do amazing things you know, with vast engineering resources. But if you ever want to change your mind, like it is actually uh, kind of hard. And so, so you just kind of have to be okay saying, well, this is what we're going to be doing for the next, you know, year or two. And I mean, I don't know, maybe there's some cooler way to do it, but we're not going to do it because it's too, too hard to switch at this point. <laughs> You know, maybe, maybe we'll think about it again in a couple of years. I mean, it, it it sounds maybe sad if you're coming from a startup world, but in in a way, it's it's freeing because you're just like, just like this is what we're doing. We're doing this. No, listen, I, I think that's that's the the reality of of the world today, and I think it's you know certainly true on our end. You know, being a, a storage provider, an OLTP database. I mean, those are not probably changes people want to be making a whole heck of a lot of times in their career. And so, um, you know, it is, it is both freeing and, and sometimes challenging to be, to be in that space. Well, Matt, I really, really enjoyed, uh, this chat with you, getting to know you, getting to know your background and history. You've done some, uh, amazing things. We could have probably spent hours and we may have you back to talk, talk more, but we certainly could have spent even longer today talking about, all the interesting work that you've done. So really, really appreciate your time here today. Great. You're, you're welcome. Ha- happy to do it. Yeah. Thanks for having me.